Stephen, an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. We welcome everybody in today on what I'm calling the statement weekend of the year. Not really a judgment day game for the Terps, but it is one for the Ravens. But right now I'm going to bring in my good buddy to talk all things Maryland after one of the most hectic weeks in the history of the University of Maryland football program or, you know, almost any program. And that, of course, is my buddy Wayne Viner. Wayne, welcome in tonight. Good morning, Bruce. It has been one heck of a week for the folks that follow the Maryland Terrapins. And if anybody's interested in sports at all, you know what's been happening at Maryland because it's been on every headline. It's been in the New York Post, the New York Times, everywhere. It's just about the, the dysfunction at Maryland. But we've spoken a lot about that on the podcast and on the air. So maybe today's about a football game. Which way do you want to go with this, Bruce? Both, because we can't, uh, we can't go along to my audience in Baltimore without talking about what happened. And then we'll get into the game a little bit. But uh, it, it was just, uh, we were there Tuesday at the Board of Regents meeting. And I think we kind of both went in there. The rumor was, the rumor was out before the meeting. All right. So we knew that what was going to happen per se, or we thought we knew. But then when it happened, and it's funny, Wayne, when we were at that meeting, there was a feeling in the air of like, uh, what's the right word? Revolution among, among the media. And the questions to then head of the Board of Regents, uh, Brady, were, I don't like to use the word contentious, but they were more or less challenging. Is that, is that the right word? Well, when we left the press conference that was focused on reinstating D.J. Durkin, on Tuesday afternoon, Mason said to me, that was a New York press conference. I said, it was pretty good. That was close to a New York press conference. The, the media was out for digging for answers. And one of the reasons that I think it was so contentious at the end, is the Board of Regents didn't actually show what their hand was. They did not discuss why, in particular, they made the recommendation that they did. Their basic answer, as you brought up on our Wednesday show, was that they followed the recommendations in the report, but they didn't really get into why. Well, and let's move on, because then, to move on, you know, we go about, we do the show, we go about our business, we're thinking about uh, DJ coming back, you see it on the news, and you start to hear that a couple of the players rebelled in, the, uh, uh, in his meeting, they walked out. And you start to hear some student ground swell. And then the next day, I'm playing golf because it was 70 degrees. I get a call from Mason, and he says to me, uh, Bruce, it's really bad. I said, I said, what do you mean it's really bad? He said, things are really bad. He started telling me about the 1,000 people marched and the boycott, not the boycott, the uh the uh, revolution against, you know, uh, or the, like the uh, groundswell to get rid of DJ. And then before you knew it, 8 o'clock that night, and I'm sure it was done early, the announcement was made that B DJ was fired and uh, Dr. Lowe did it. He, uh, he kind of went against the board, all right, supposedly. He originally wanted to fire DJ. And then... We hear about a fight between the players, between the punters, believe it or not. And you start to hear some contentiousness among the team. And then yesterday, did I see it correctly that there's now a demand that Dr. Lowe must keep his retirement from the students? That there's going to be a round? The, right. The fire low or low must go contingent has now shown up in College Park, which is Dr. Lowe in that press conference we referred to on Tuesday, 
announced that in June of 2019, he will retire from the from the position of the president of the University of Maryland at College Park. But since then, the provost, deans, and professors have written a letter in favor of Dr. Lowe's actions in terminating DJ and have put out a call for him to possibly rescind his retirement and stay on as the president. So now there's a movement that Lowe, Lowe must go. It is time for him to stick to his plans and move on from College Park in what is now, what, seven months, eight months from now. At the end of the academic year, the University of Maryland academic year is a fiscal year. It ends on June 30th of 2019. That kind of makes him an interim president. <laughs> oh, there's your favorite word, interim. Uh, you know, well, that word you interim? Told me, when that word interim gets attached to you, all right, it means you're done, all right? That word interim is the end, all right? If you're, well, wait, if I ever say, is. if I ever say you're the interim co-host, all right, look out. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> you've called me worse, but you haven't. <laughs> right now, that would be a put down. Uh, yeah, the label interim at Maryland has always led to terminations and disaster, and... Boy, that'd be a good way to put this week. I wrote a column yesterday that started with the phrase and reused it several times. Of course, this will calm down. And you and I have said that to each other throughout the week. And every time we've said it, it's gotten worse. So, so then, so then, the students yesterday apparently announced a boycott of the game, which, for the life of me, I can't figure out why. In other words, what? Would the true support of the player's position uh, be to go out there and support them today and to go show up in all mass and support the players? And then yet they announce a boycott. Well, one would think that if they were thinking that this was about football. The, and I'm not saying it's every student, but there's an element of the student body that wants to boycott the football game because they don't like the idea that their student activities fees goes to football and they're anti-football at the moment. But I think it comes down to power. They don't want, this is a section of the students, doesn't want the Board of Regents to come in and tell this particular branch of the university what to do. And they are mad that the Board of Regents got involved. They're mad that there's rules that whether you go to the games or support football or not, there's a student activity fee, part of that goes to football. They're just mad. And in, in a strange way, I think Dr. Lowe might have misplayed his hand a bit if he had let the student protest go on so that his removal of DJ was in response to the student protest, they might have been sated and gone away. But he might have actually let him go too soon. The students are still mad, and right now are looking at a way to show their frustration, and some of them picked today's game at 12 o'clock against Michigan State to show their dissatisfaction. Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm still hoping there'll be a decent crowd there, although I don't know. I really don't know. So, where do the Terps go from here? Now, here's my, I said it on our podcast the other night, I'm going to say it now, and I don't care about the order. I don't care about anything else. There's one guy out there who I believe can immediately rebuild and thus save the program and maybe even step it up. And it was a guy who was overlooked, really just uh, give it a quick look to become the new coach of Maryland when Randy Etzel was fired. And as he was the interim coach, we knew what that meant, Wayne. And that, of course, is Mike Loxley. Here's my point. He has gone to Alabama, and he has uh, helped engineer that offense into a machine that makes Alabama look like an offensive team where as great as they are, they never were looked at like a tremendous offensive team. But uh, what he's done with Tua and just engineered his, that offense, he's been fantastic. 
Mike Loxley is the guy that Maryland needs. And I'll tell you what I think. I'd hire him now. I'd try and steal him now because who in the hell cares about Alabama? Who cares about Nick Saban? All right? Right. I mean, Alabama, it's not like they're a national program. I mean, nobody's even heard of them before. But who cares about them? Do you well, honestly, yeah, Mike, do you honestly care don't. about Alabama after the five so after the twenty five people that they got to go there that might have gone to Maryland? I mean, is this a is this a, a sportsman like uh, move? You know, the, no, you no, can't touch. This is you about can't, winning here. You, you can't touch Loxley until the season's over. Why? I mean, first of all, Loxley's might be. The only guy in the country who's dying to come here, other than those who don't have a job and want to get paid a couple million dollars a year. Loxley wants to come here to be the head coach. He owns this area. For those of you who don't know it, he's the number one recruiter and there's not a a close second. Mike Loxley will destroy uh, James Franklin in this area. Well, uh, we always get up. So, look, Maryland has some pretty good recruiters now, which is Azar Abdurrahim, who was at Alabama. When Mike went there, Azar came to Maryland. He was the head coach at SCA. Beatty, the wide receiver coach here in Maryland, is doing great in the 757, which is the Tidewater area of Virginia. Um, is that the 804? I can't remember anymore. So if you add Mike Loxley and the high school coaches in this area, D.C., Baltimore, Northern Virginia, they love Mike Loxley. That's one of the top reasons to get him because it's going to repair all the fractures that have happened with the D.J. thing, with the Randy Etzel thing. You bring in Mike Loxley, you have an in with all the local talent if you can recruit here. And it's always been said about Maryland under the sleeping giant. If Maryland could just recruit at home, they'd be a national power. Mike Loxley gives you a chance at that. I'm not so concerned at what he did in Alabama. I just want somebody who can lock down the DMV, and we'll go from there. Well, look, here's Mike Loxley, who was really up for the job, and I got that in quotes. He never had a chance for the job, just for the record, in my opinion. And my opinion is pretty good on this topic. He never had a chance and DJ got the job, and here he is, a guy who was, like, looked over, passed over, and he wants to come back. And please don't tell me about his record at New Mexico. We all make mistakes in life, and his going to New Mexico was just an outright mistake. I mean, you know, first of all, how could he pull, and he did pull his kids somewhat from from the area to go to New Mexico, but New Mexico, let's be real. I mean, as far as being from around here and New Mexico, were they ever a power? I bet they've never been a top 10 team ever. But anyway, Loxley wants to come back. Loxley's the guy. And uh, I know, well, you're supposed to have the president so he can hire the AD. And, you know, if Maryland does it their old fashioned way, by the time they get around to it, Mike Loxley will be coaching probably at one of the SEC schools that have failed, that has had failures this year or somewhere, you know, he's not going to last forever as the best offensive AD in the country. That's my take. So there's a chance. Look, it's not just your take, Bruce. Uh, Who gets most of the open jobs? Nick Saban assistants get a huge number of college jobs. Right now, Mike Loxley is the number one Nick Saban assistant. So you're right. When the next big job comes up, he's going to be in there because he fits the profile now. And here's a guy who who wants to come to Maryland. You know? Well... This is where he wants to be. That's what I hear. That's what Kavanaugh says, and that's what everybody says. Scott Green says it, that he's dying to get this job to come back here. After all that's happened, after the position Maryland is in nationally right now, and Mike Loxley, if he goes into the home of recruits and says, I'm here now, this foolishness that happened, this insanity that happened, is not going to happen again. People will believe him because he's Mike Loxley. 
and he's they a, believe him now. They believe him at Alabama, and they'll believe him here. So with with the few minutes we have left in this segment today, we could actually become bowl eligible. You think after all of this upset? This week, we got a chance to keep it together as a team uh, on the field. I, I, I am not thinking that they do. And I would have thought that maybe they could all rally together. But when I start hearing about fights in the locker room. and There some, was one guy, Bruce. That's one a, kid. That's, that's bad. A hundred of the other players. So there's 85 kids on scholarship. There's about 15 walk-ons on average. Kind of up to about 100 kids. One kid got in a fight. I don't, and a hundred players came up and said, "That's not what happened. That kid baited this into a fight." I'm not taking that as a divided locker room. In fact, I'm taking that as we're all in for Maryland. It wasn't a fifty-fifty split. It was a hundred to nothing. No, it was a ninety-nine was- to one then. Okay, but, but. Uh, how about picking on the guy who used to play rules football, all right? And he's 30 years well, old. <laughs> and his mean, brother's a professional boxer. Right. That's well, not the guy you pick a fight with. No, it's Wade Lees what? we're talking about, the punter. But he wasn't suspended today, was he, for that? Or was he? I, if you want to fracture the team, go suspend him. Then you'll get <laughs> people walking out. He is still on the team, to the best of my knowledge at this time. We're on the way to the stadium, um, trying to be in position for Mason's stadium show. I'm not sure we're going to be on campus, but Mason will be on in the third segment to do the whip around. Might still be in the car at that point. Tell me about, tell me about Rocky Lombardi. Does he you start? Want a little Rocky Lombardi? Does he start today? I think Lewerke's still hurt. I think you're going to get the backup quarterback stepping in, which is Rocky Lombardi. He was really good last week. But, and Mason will tell you why later, but he's pretty accurate that Michigan State is really good one week and pretty bad the next week, and they just keep flipping back and forth. They were really good last week. I suspect that maybe they won't be as good. But I think most of this, is on Maryland's ability to come out and play with some vengeance against the week that was. You have to have a perception. The Ravens had a history of being really good at this. It's us against the world, and the world's going to pay. Well, I need this Maryland team. We all do. We need this Maryland team on this day to come back together and play with the, the purpose and fever that they played when they took on Texas. Because you've seen that they can do it. I hope this week brings this team closer together and we, we actually get to, to see the good Maryland today against maybe the not-so-hot Michigan State. And uh, winning cures a lot. A win today would be big. And, of course, really big. Of course we're, overlo- we're overlooking the interim coach, Matt Canada. All right. <laughs> I hate to use that word, but uh, I guess now he's the head coach. You know, I, I considered him the head coach all year. We didn't really talk about our feelings about that press conference. I was, I don't want to get back into it, but I just have to say, I was absolutely stunned and shocked that the Board of Regents ever reinstated DJ. I'm a DJ guy. I just never thought they'd do it. So I've been thinking Matt Canada's the coach all year. Yeah, well, we didn't really know that answer. And one thing I did tell you as it went along is that each day that went by was in the favor of DJ being retained with the Board of Regents. Because it almost was like they were looking for a a reason to keep him. But I don't think anybody felt the the national reaction to it. uh, when it. When it happened, then it was time for DJ to go. And it probably... Was a shame that they didn't let him let him go right away, rather than twist in the wind for five months. And uh, they should. I mean, I always thought for the first second he wasn't going to be uh, allowed to stay. I mean, from the second, yeah. from the second it happened. But as it went on, it seemed like they were going to go ahead. But you know, again, with all the talk, you know, and now you know DJ's gone and. Uh, uh, poor uh, Jordan McDare is still gone. All right, but he's gone for real. He's like not a you know. 
you know, it's just... Before uh, we move on, yeah. I, I know up against the clock now. I got one question for you. Go ahead. Uh, just about football in general. How fired up are you to have two big games to go to this weekend? Well, I'm, I'm very fired up, and uh, I don't put the Maryland game as far as a game goes. Maryland game is about 50 other things, about attendance, who shows up. Win or lose is, you know, their season's not over either way. I believe that if the Ravens lose, their season is done. And it could be mean the end of Joe Flacco and eventually possibly lead to the end of John Harbaugh. And it doesn't seem fair for that to happen. But that's the way it is in the NFL. All right. And I'll go into that in the next segment. So with that, Wayne, thanks a lot for checking in. And uh, we will certainly see you today at the game and remind Mason to get me a lunch because I'll be there close to game time. (laughs) All right, and lunches are gone by 11.15. And today, I don't know how many press are going to be there. But uh, uh, that's it. Thanks for coming on, uh, Wayne. Have fun at the tailgate. All righty, thanks. Church. All right, this is Bruce Posner. You're listening to Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. We'll be back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Call 410-298-3800. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, Sports Maven. So, let's move from today to tomorrow. And this is, to me, the Ravens-Steelers game. This season's on the line. And why do I say that? That sounds, well, wait a minute. What is he saying? Why is this season only the, the ninth game? First of all, the Ravens, this is their bye week. It's always great to win on your bye week. It keeps the attitude great. And if you want to know what I'm talking about, watch what happens if they lose tomorrow. All right? Watch what happens in in town and uh, the questions and John Harbaugh's attitude. And look, John Harbaugh's been great. He's been a great coach. He's been very successful, uh, runs a great program. But the way the way I take it, is that they went out and they got him three receivers. All right, and that was the real weakness last year. And the defense is rated or was rated one or two all season long. It probably still is that, that high or nearby. And after all that's happened, all right, the team is four and four. Why is the team four and four? Because they lost two games that should have been won. And they lost two games late in the game. Two games, one of which because the quarterback could not engineer a drive in overtime. And remember, against Cleveland, Jake, he had two opportunities to drive the team 20 yards to let Tucker try the insane 55-yard field goal. Couldn't do it. Couldn't Mm -hmm. get it done. They saw it on the fourth quarter two weeks ago against New Orleans, too. That was worse. Mm-hmm. All right, 17-7, to seven, and you figure the start of the fourth quarter, New Orleans is going to get the ball twice, and the Ravens are going to get the ball twice. New Orleans scored two touchdowns, and the Ravens went zippity doo da. All right, and what happened at the end happened, and the extra point miss never should have been a factor. You don't lose the pull. You don't lose a game on one play. You lose a game, all right, when Hayden Hurst is seven yards behind the defender and you underthrow him again. You underthrow him. Last week's not even worth talking about. Last week was an embarrassment, mm-hmm. what Carolina did to the Ravens. And may I add, the only pleasant thing about that game was the play of DJ Moore. All right. The yeah, next that was- he was fantastic. We thought, yeah, we thought Torrey Smith might have most of the plays that day, but he, he ended play. up being hurt. But he then, still uh, hurt, by the way. But I mean, going back, like this is Flacco's crucial year, and he has played better. But if you look around, like the quarterback ratings in the NFL, he's ranked like 25th or something, and his yards per attempt is still not as high as many quarterbacks in the league. Like despite how well he's played, when you compare it around the NFL, and there are a lot of great quarterbacks, but he's still on the in the bottom half. Check down, check down, check down, check down, yeah. check down. All right. So, why is this game so important? Number one, it's not like if we were playing 
Kansas City this week, if we were playing New England, if we were playing uh, the Rams, I would say, you know what, they're, they're losing. I mean, I, you know, it's just the, it's the state that they're in. But we're playing a team that we beat, we handily beat a few weeks ago, and we need to beat them again for more reason than one. And the main is 5-2-1 and one is what Pittsburgh would be after this game if they win. And the Ravens would be 4-5. and five. Well, folks... They're not catching Pittsburgh. Even when Pittsburgh had a losing record, I still said to myself, they're not out of it. Yeah. Well, listen, they're not catching Pittsburgh. And if you look at their schedule the rest of the way, uh, three road games, one against Matt Ryan in, in Atlanta, and then they got to go out to Kansas City. Folks, they're not winning that game. I know the, the Steelers have a harder schedule, though. They have to play. The two division winners from last year, of course, the Patriots and the Jaguars in Jacksonville, a place that's given or an opponent that's given them trouble in, in recent memory. And they have to play the Saints and I believe the Chargers too as well. So I mean, because they finished in first place last year, they have a much tougher road ahead, but they clearly look a lot better right now. Yeah, they have the uh, penalty of finishing first. Of course the Ravens were able to gather uh Oakland and Tennessee mm-hmm. by finishing where they finished. Mm-hmm. And you know, let's be real. They squashed Tennessee, and they should. Oakland is just hapless. Yeah, I think they got uh, they got Buffalo too from finishing where they finished last year, which they got. They they want to play New England or a improved Dolphins team or anything like that. Right, so that's, right. That's so good. everything worked in their favor. And uh, what can I say except that uh, they have to win this game? They can't fall that far behind. And you know, you start thinking about what's going to happen. I honestly believe that we should see more of Lamar Jackson, certainly inside the red zone. And uh, Joe, when he gets inside that red zone, and also with the weakness of the offensive line right now due to injuries, Lamar Jackson is much more capable of escaping a, a sack and making a play happen. Joe just isn't. Whether it's still his knee, he just isn't moving quickly. He doesn't escape the rush too well. He's not throwing on. He's not throwing well on the run, and he threw two of the most god awful interceptions last week. And now Ronnie Stanley and James Hurst aren't playing tomorrow already, and Alex Lewis is still questionable. So Ronnie Stanley's out definitely. <laughs> he's out. He's got an ankle injury. It was announced yesterday, and Hurst still has the back. Problem. I know Hurst is out. Well, they got so, they got real problems. Well. Yeah. That's that's like an excuse for not winning, but it's also an excuse for using Lamar Jackson more. It really is. And luckily, I mean, they're going to have to get creative for sure. Luckily, the, I mean, T.J. Watt's their most formidable pass rusher, but the Steelers' defense isn't anything to be too afraid of. But when you're losing three starting offensive linemen on a on a line that was already struggling in run coverage, it, it's, it's going to be a challenge, and I think we're going to see a lot of Lamar tomorrow just for the sake of being creative. Yeah. Uh, well, the Ronnie Stanley thing definitely brings that to a head. Uh, I guess we'll see how that goes. He's been frustrating. He's been, he's been hurt a lot. Just a, He hasn't been able to consistently stay on the field, and people think that he's a, a top-tier tackle. I, I haven't been convinced of that yet. I need to see more. I don't know when he plays he is, but he's got to play. Yeah. And uh, you're right, he has missed too many games. And uh, So who moves to left tackle, the rookie? <sighs> see, I think they're going to keep him at right tackle because he's he's taken literally all of his reps through camp and practice there. I think maybe they, I mean, I could see an instance where maybe they would put Orlando Brown at left tackle and put Marshall at right tackle, or maybe they'll do what they did last week and keep Brown at right tackle and have Jermaine Illuminor at left tackle. But Alex Lewis, if he plays, he's played tackle before. So um, there's a lot of different possibilities. I'm afraid to ask, do they have any backups from that? I was going to ask the guy from my website who writes for me to go try out. (laughs) They might need him. He's got the size. Well... I don't know what to say, but somehow or another, you know, you have to deal with injuries. And uh, they got the guy who can play in that situation. His name is Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. All right. And, uh, well, I tell you one thing. It tells you without question, in my opinion, that you're going to see no huddle, Lamar. You're mm-hmm. going to see a sped up game to try and tire down the defensive line, not let them get set up, not let them get in their play calls. Because if you go... You know, 30 seconds in the huddle, that's going to be, that could be disastrous. This, the defense needs to play better tomorrow, too. I mean, we need to see, I expect Ben to attack the middle of the field with McDonald and Jesse James right away, considering the Ravens have struggled 
keeping the middle of the field uh, covered. And C.J. Mosley is also questionable with a thigh injury. Um, but I would he practiced yesterday, so he's probably going to play. But even when he's been active, the middle of the field defending that has been an issue for the Ravens, as has pass coverage. Jefferson, Weddle, and Smith have all struggled. Um, surprisingly, the most consistent guy, I feel like, has been Brandon Carr the last few weeks at his advanced age. But the pass rush, too, needs to show up. They had one sack last week. You can't. You know, there's a lot of money that's going to be uh... – there's a lot of guys who will create a lot of cap room. Oh, yeah. All right? And uh, I think at this point, I don't see a way that Joe comes back. All right? I was talking to my dad last night. If I were the GM, I'd cut a number of guys on that, on, I mean, both on offense and defense that are taking up space like Mosley. I'd cut Jefferson. I'd cut Jimmy Smith. I'd, I'd just start all over. Not cut, release. All right. <clears throat> Before we go to the break, uh, Clayton Kershaw. Three-year, $93 million extension with the Dodgers after being humbled in Game 5 of the World Series. Uh, but, of course, it was a vastly superior Red Sox team. It wasn't even close. In fact, I'll go on to say that the Dodgers could not have beat the Yankees. The Dodgers could not have beat Houston. And the Dodgers could not have beat Cleveland. Mm-hmm. I think the four best teams in baseball reside in the American League. It seems like that's been a... It's been a pattern for the last it's couple all of years. About the, in my opinion, it's all about the DH. Yeah, I don't. I, I've had this debate before. I just don't know if the National League is ever going to be willing to change their ways. They seem to be very old school. But I don't. I don't really lean one way or the other. I guess I'm used to watching American League more. So I. Oh, I, let me tell you something. The, you talk about a game that 18 inning game. All right, was so boring. All right, that it was beyond belief. Do you stay up for the whole thing? Uh, I fell asleep twice. Okay. I was smart enough the second time I fell asleep, I T-voted. All right? So when I woke up about, you know, you know how you wake up, you're waiting to see you something, I went back and I watched it, and I kind of knew that it was over when the uh, uh, when the Red Sox didn't score in the top half of the inning. Yeah. I went to bed, like, in the eighth or ninth inning, and I woke up at, you know, four in the morning and come down here for my weekend shift, and I looked at my phone and I said, like, holy crap, this game ended like an hour ago. <laughs> like, you know what's great about the World Series that I loved, all right? And I'm not a Red Sox fan. I hate him. I can't stand him. But I don't hate Steve Pierce. I love either. Steve Pierce. And how he was the MVP and how he stepped up. And it absolutely reminds me of our five-game win over Philadelphia. You know who stepped up then? It was Rick Dempsey. Mm-hmm. Rick Dempsey was like out of, he was just unbelievable. And Rick Dempsey is certainly the same kind of guy you love, the guy who's the heart of the team, the guy who doesn't get that respect. And here's Steve P- Pierce, who's been on all five teams. And when you go back and think about Steve Pierce's tenure with the Orioles, it was nothing but positive, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. But he was always a guy who was expendable. He, yeah, he uh, was a crucial part of their, uh, um, American League East winning team. I mean, he filled in for Chris Davis when he was suspended. And I know that a lot of the guys in the playoffs struggled, but he was really a a key player. And arguably, I mean, Davis barely hit above 200 in the regular season that year, I think. Like, he was arguably better than he was. Please, please. (laughs) I've had a bad enough week. Don't bring up the name Chris Davis, all right? (laughs) Please don't bring it up. It's been a long one for sure. And, of course, I had a little talk with Kyle before, our new producer, and – I said, give me some insight because he covers the Orioles. Or he, he worked on the Orioles here. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know anything. I don't think anybody knows anything about who's going to take now it's over. A, it's a mystery. Or you, you hear crickets. You hear the um, the tumbleweed. Like that's. <laughs> but I don't understand how you could go day after day without a guy in charge. It's right? when you lose 115 games, too, especially. <laughs> I mean, did that affect us losing Vic, the victors? Does that, did that affect us losing the pitcher? I mean, I don't know. I understand they're signing some 15-year-old kids out of the Dominican. One of which, his last name is Machado, which is kind of ironic. But Is he 15? Speaking of Machado. I think he's about 15, 16. Speaking of Machado, I don't know if the Dodgers want him back, I'll be honest with you. Watch, I, him, watch him wind up uh, with the world champions or with the Yankees. The Phillies could be an interesting one, too, because McPhail is still there, and he's the one that drafted him, and they have a lot of money to spend. But I think either him or Harper, one of the two, will end up in Philly. Hmm. Well... So whatever, but to me, it's always like the rich get richer. So I, I kind of think the Yankees might, or that would be, you know, uh, imagine Stanton, you know, yeah. and uh, Judge, and a large part of the fan base has already turned on Manny too because of his uh, issues in the World Series and the playoffs. So especially if he's a Yankee or a Red Sox, he's quickly going to become a villain very quickly. Yeah, but you know he re- relishes in that role, but he sure didn't do it. 
you know, what the hell, he, he wound up striking it out on a low pitch. But at least he went down low to try and hit it. You really hope All he... Right? You really hope he stays in the National League, though, because if he plays here four or three times a year, he's not going to be happy with how the Orioles didn't even offer him an extension. He's just going to mash the ball off us every time he comes here. All right, let's get out to break number two. This is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. And, of course, this past section, this past uh, segment was brought to you by Coons Ford and, of course, Science and Kirk. And Science and Kirk will present In the Nest tomorrow here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Back in a few minutes. This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. Hey, back here on Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven, and uh, going to wind up the show with a little whip around sports world with my buddy Mason. Mason, you there, pal? Yes, I am. Thanks for having me, Bruce. Always a pleasure, and uh, tone that music down there, young man. Okay, let's start with the Wizards. Is this the most pathetic thing you've seen? Do you know that they were down 79 to 50 at halftime last night? I mean, to bring in Dwight Howard and Austin Rivers. You know Austin Rivers makes $13 million a year? Have you ever? Yes, yes, I did know that. Can you believe? Is that insane or am I crazy? You know? Um, At this point, Bruce. Uh, it is both insane and yes, you are crazy. Okay, but how can you bring in? How can you bring in Austin Rivers making thirteen million dollars? Well, what, what has he done? Well, they took they took his contract in exchange for Gortat, who was making the same the same thirteen million. So it was kind of just i uh, I'll take your bad cap and you'll take mine. Well, that makes more sense. Thank the, thank heavens, there's something makes sense out of this. But they are pathetic. Is Scotty Brooks on the hot seat right now? Yeah, I think he's um, close to as good as done right now because the way they're playing now is just, it's awful. 140, what was it, 141 they gave up last night to Oklahoma City. They gave up all those points to the Warriors, but everyone has. They're just, they're just bad. That's, that's pretty much the answer at this point, and there's not much explanation for it. When you take a look around the league last night, there was a, kind of like a, an anomaly that happened, and, of course, Golden State stopped it. I think there were eight games yesterday. Do you know that seven road teams won? And actually, Minnesota was winning that game in the fourth quarter against Golden State. But, of course, Golden State came back. But seven road teams won yesterday in the NBA. And the new guy on the hot seat in the NBA, he's kind of hot. I'd say the warm seat is Luke Walton. Apparently, Magic Johnson is pretty upset about uh, the Lakers starting off three and five, and they really don't look good. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch any of them. I saw a game or two, and yeah, you're right. He is on the hot seat because when a team brings in LeBron, they just expect to win. And For the Lakers, I really didn't think that it was going to work that way. I thought it would take a little bit of time, and apparently Magic isn't willing to give them that time. So I really don't know what to tell you. I think Luke Walton's a pretty good coach. I think they should stick with it. I mean, what have they played now? Eight games? Nine it's, games? It's all for early, but they've had a lot of home games. And also, they got a problem. I watch, you know, I watch the NBA very, very closely. And when you watch them and Rondo's in there, I mean, Rondo's a great player, but somehow or another, it messes with the chemistry of the team. I mean, I saw in a couple games that they won without Rondo, and it was Lonzo Ball and, and a few other guards, uh, the kid Hart from Villanova. There seemed to be a better better rhythm. But the, what's the word, the ball hogging of uh, Rajon Rondo, it's not working. And I think, to me, just to my uh, unobservant or naked eye, that something's wrong. Something's wrong with that team with Rondo. Now, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe it's early. But they do not look like a playoff team to me in the uh, very tough West Coast Conference. Yeah, um, as far as Rondo, uh, he's kind of like him, Cousins. They're guys that are toxic-ish players. And not, a lot, not a lot of teams win with them, and a lot of teams dump them off, and that's why Rondo at this point, even though he doesn't play like it, is a near-minimum contract guy. 
that because you're right, he does mess up chemistry, even though he's a great player. Steve Kerr yesterday said that uh, Boogie Cousins is there for one year and he, they wanted to get better in play so he can get a good contract from somewhere else. However, there's that possibility that uh, Kevin Durant could bolt, and that's why Boogie Cousins is there. In case Kevin Durant leaves, which he can after this year, why he would leave, I don't know. But maybe he gets tired of winning. I, I'm really not sure. But that team, I'm telling you, watch them play. I watched them last night in the fourth quarter, and and it's almost like it's a joke. They're so much better than anybody else. I don't care on whatever level. I, you know, say people say, well, Boston can give them a run. Toronto with Kawhi Leonard can give them a run. I don't think so. I think they'll run anybody out. I think this, if there's barring injuries, all right, there's no way that Gold State goes down. Mason, let's take a look around the college football world. I picked out five games. I want to get your take on all of them. First of all, you got Sparty's a three-point favorite over the Terps today, and we don't know what Maryland team is going to show up. We don't know if the fans are going to show up. We don't know what's going to happen. How's that game go, in your opinion? I think Maryland takes it. I don't think that. Michigan State's had two good weeks yet in a row this year. They've struggled a lot against teams that can really run the football, and they're injured. That's, that's really – there's one word to describe Michigan State football this year. It is injured, and I think that will have a big effect. And Maryland's got a lot of passion right now, and they're an angry team. And I love a football team that's angry, Bruce. Yeah, well, you know, people say, well, the fans are good. The fans have been there one game this year, and they played pretty well at home if you throw out the Temple game. And it's it's how the players come out. And I think there is – Wayne convinced me the players are unified minus one guy who got punched in the face. But uh, the players are unified, and therefore maybe, maybe that'll be the telling tale. Iowa, Iowa, two and a half at Purdue favored. Underdog, rather. Yeah, that, that's my pick of the day, Bruce. You just got, gave it to me right there. Uh, Iowa, I think Iowa's a really good football team. Last week, Penn State and their fourth quarter was tried to hand Iowa the game, but it just didn't work out that way. Uh, Purdue, you know, they might have had that one bo- out-of-body experience against Ohio State, but they whipped them, and that was fun to watch. Penn State, that dig this spread, Mason. I can't figure it out. Maybe you can tell me why. Is Trace McSorley not playing today? No, he's playing. They're 12 it's just, point Michigan's underdogs. That dominant. Michigan's that dominant. Penn State is not good. They have not looked good against the good teams, especially once they can play defense like Michigan does. Michigan's a new team now. Shea Patterson's into his role. It's their role, in, and I think they can beat Ohio State, and I think that they're a college football playoff team. Does that make them uh, a pick with uh, laying 12 points to Penn State? Last time I looked at it was 10, and uh, yes, I would lay the 10, but 12, 12's pushing it. Penn State's 350 on the money line. That means if you spend 100 on Penn State, you win 350, yep. which is surprising. Notre Dame, here's another game I don't get. Nine and a half at Northwestern. Uh, I'm a Northwestern better there. and North- I am not. Northwestern's, Northwestern's tough at home, though. quite sketchy these past two weeks, Bruce, and so is Notre Dame. I think the Irish got it rolling. If you want to take the nine, I could see it as like a game that ends 17 to 10. That There's your nine play right there. Yeah. Bama, 14 against LSU on the road. Bama hasn't okay, played Bruce, anybody. They haven't best, played anybody. Best money line of the week. LSU plus 445. Wow. Wow. So there you go. That's, that's my small play if you want to take one. Put 10 on LSU. Take your $45 if they happen to win the game. That would be interesting. But I, I, I think that will be a closer game than, than imagined. But not if Mike Loxley is up to his old magic because he has been a heck of an offensive coordinator. I'm in the Mike Loxley camp as, a, uh, as he should be the new head coach. But uh, that, unfortunately, is going to do it for today. Mason, we'll see you at the game. I hope we'll be sitting together. And uh, that will do it for today, everybody. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend. This is Bruce Posner signing off for Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. And remember, tomorrow, In the Nest, Science of Kirk Presents In the Nest at 9 a.m. We will really depict, go through the entire Pittsburgh Steel or Raven game. Have a good week, everybody.